Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 88th Annual LULAC National Convention Exposition, and welcome to this wonderful workshop we're having here this morning. My name is Rachel Haynes, and I'm a LULAC National Policy and Legislation Intern at the National Office in D.C. I am also a rising senior political science and Spanish major here at Trinity University in San Antonio, so it is good to be home. Before I introduce the moderator for this panel, I would like to ask all of you to share your insights if you are active on social media and spread the word about this amazing panel and what you learned today using either the handle at LULAC or the hashtag LULAC17 so we can spread the word about what goes on here this morning. We would also like to ask you to take out your phone and text JUNTOS at 52886. That's JUNTOS at 52886 to join our team of advocates who form part of our rapid response team that help us push Congress and our current administration on key issues of importance to our community. And so without further delay, I'm honored to introduce our moderator for today's presentation, Thomas Sayens, the President and General Counsel of MALDEF. Thank you, Rachel, and good morning, everyone. Thank you to LULAC for permitting us to hold this very important workshop. Uh, in addition to being President and General Counsel of MALDEF, I am the Vice Chair of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, NHLA, uh, which put together this panel. Uh, because we recognize as a coalition of 40 of the most prominent Latino civil rights organizations in the United States, the national importance of Texas SB4. Before we get much further, I do want to acknowledge our SB4 task force co-chairs at NHLA who are here and put together this uh, important workshop, Ben Monterroso of Mi Familia Bota. and Kenneth Romero of NHCSL. This is the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators. Yeah. So we, we are here because NHLA recognizes as national organizations our obligation to not only support the efforts of those inside of Texas to resist SB4, to prevent its implementation, and to organize around the threat that it presents, the very serious threat that it presents, the Latino community in Texas, but at NHLA we also recognize the national repercussions of a bill like this, the most draconian anti-immigrant legislation we have seen in decades. And that's saying something when we're only seven years removed from the enactment of Arizona's SB 1070 and the enactment in 2011 of five other states' versions of that law. So at NHLA, we very much see SB4 as an issue of national concern to the Latino community around which we must work to support those in Texas, and more important, to prevent replication anywhere else in the country, whether at the federal level under the current administration or in any other state. Texas, the second largest state in the country, critically important in setting a national agenda and currently what it's doing and contributing to our national agenda is not positive for the Latino community. We fortunately have a wonderful panel of folks from Texas who have been involved from the beginning, the introduction of SB4 in the State Senate, its enactment, and its challenging, challenging court, as well as the organizing around resisting SB4 around the state of Texas, and building off of it to ensure that the Latino community and its allies can participate civically and guarantee that in the future, leaders who support measures like SB4 will not be in positions of authority in the state of Texas. So I'll introduce them each as they come up and make introductory remarks or from their seats. And first, we have a now 10-term participant in the Texas State House of Representatives, one of the leaders in opposing SB4, to talk to us about the enactment of this bill. There was certainly much controversy around it. Some of that controversy will be taken up in court, has already been taken up in court, uh, but it is my great pleasure to introduce from the Dallas area, Representative Roberto Olanzo. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to cover uh, the, the 
agenda he mentioned. And first, I want to thank uh, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda for putting this together and taking a national uh, effort in combating SB4. Because as Thomas mentioned, what happens in Texas affects the rest of the country as well. I also join in thanking uh, the National Caucus of Hispanic State Legislators who Kenneth was introduced. I'm a part of the national group and our organization is a part of the Hispanic leadership agenda. So this bill, SB4, was initially filed by Charles Perry in November 2016. Uh, and it has several provisions. And I'm gonna go through them briefly and then uh, comment a little bit about what happened in Austin. Uh, the, the first part forbids cities, towns, counties, and universities from becoming or maintaining sanctuary cities or sanctuary colleges for undocumented immigrants and allows the Attorney General of Texas to request that the state court remove from office any elected or appointed official, even for endorsing a sanctuary policy or enforcing one already in place. This limitation on sanctuary policies also extends to unwritten policies and common practices, and the law allows any citizen who resides in the town or city or county or any employee or student of a college or university to file a complaint stating that the citizen believes the city or town or county or university is behaving as a sanctuary city or university, and that is enough to trigger a case to remove elected officials and employees from their jobs if they are government jobs or posts. Originally, this was going to be true uh, for doing this, even for churches, but, uh, but thanks to the great pushback from our Hispanic evangelical pastors, who were the largest group to bring people to the capital to lobby against the law, an amendment was passed stating that one of only two places where an officer can give people a break is inside a church. So uh, please thank the Hispanic evangelical pastors were heavily involved. Uh, I can tell you personally being there at the Capitol, uh, probably 90-95% of the people that would come, the bodies, were Hispanic evangelical pastors. So we thank them and they, we thank the Catholic Conference of Bishops. There's another provision, it's called the jailing provision. SB requires all local, county, and state law enforcement agencies or correction facility to hold anyone in custody who has an immigration detainer request, even beyond the time that person will normally have been held, and even though immigration detainer requests are issued by U.S. Immigration Enforcement, not by a judge. This, uh, this is unless the person can prove they are a citizen. Basically, right now, right now, uh, the national law says that INS can send a request to hold somebody. It's not an order, it's not a warrant, and that's why some of you will see around the country uh, lawsuits against uh, sheriffs who are holding people because it's a request and essentially they are illegally being held. So that's the second provision. The third thing SB does is establish show me your papers provision. Under SB4, nobody, not even their boss, can stop a commission officer or a correction officer, a booking clerk, a magistrate, or a district attorney, or prosecuting attorney from asking about and investigating the immigration status of a person, even a citizen who is under lawful detention or under arrest, including their place of birth and keeping that information forever or send it to the federal government. So that essentially is, is the bill. Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the legislative uh, effort that was done. Uh, in a nutshell, I can tell you the position we took was this was personal, the attack on, uh, this bill was a personal attack. So we uh, provided, submitted tons of amendments. I submitted a couple that I uh, argued extensively that said, why don't we implement this law after it goes to the Supreme Court? Because in the end, everything goes to court. Uh, like the Voting Rights Act, like redistricting, like the voter ID. But it was personal. Uh, why personal? Because many of us, or all of us, have a story to tell, a personal story, how immigration has a personal story. And let me tell you my personal story that I said on the floor of the house. My grandparents came from Mexico, Alonso de Luz and Emeterio from Coahuila. Uh, and some of them went to Brownwood, right one? <laughs> but many of them went to uh, uh, Toledo, Ohio. And there, my dad and aunts and uncles were born. And 
When the Depression came, they were deported back to Mexico. My dad grew up in Mexico thinking he was a Mexican. He came hiding with his brothers and sisters into the Crystal City area and they hid in the farms. So one day they talked about where they came from, where they came across and where they were born. And in the end, they commented they were born in Toledo, Ohio. And people said, you're not a Mexican. So they sent for their birth certificate. Lo and behold. Emeterio Alonso, son of Luz Emeterio Alonso, born in Franklin County, wherever the county is. So it's a personal story. So that being said, uh, overwhelmingly, all us Democrats voted against it. All the Senate House members voted against it. Uh, but there was, and maybe the people that were for it, it was uh, 12, there were 12 witnesses for it. And see, right here, this is it. And then all these pages of witnesses that were against it. So 12 against close to a thousand people that came and testified against. We want to thank the, the groups that, that helped lobby against the law. Maldiv was at the table. Uh, the, uh, Mi Familia Vota was at the table. The National Latina Institute of Reproductive Health at the table amongst the Association of Business, uh, ACLU, law enforcement agencies the Tax Council Commissions, the Workers' Defense Project, the Association of Business from San Antonio, San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, El Paso Chamber of Commerce, United We Dream, and of course, LULAC, um, American Federation of Teachers. In conclusion, I'll tell you, uh, we thank everybody. I think this is a, a continuation of what has to be done. Uh, we speak, and we will talk in a minute what else can be done. One of the things that I did was donate $1,000 to Maldiv, who was leading the fight. Uh, uh, and asking others to help in that effort. Uh, other cities, practically all the cities in, Dallas, in Texas have joined the lawsuit with the exception of Fort Worth. Uh, and finally, I'll say, how does this impact around the, the country? I was talking to a county commissioner from count, King County at the Naleo Conference, and in the end, we, we talked about how county commissioners control the budget for the sheriff, and guess what? The sheriff of King County also has to deal with this issue. So. This is a personal story, it's a personal fight, uh, but it's a fight, as, as Thomas has, has talked about, it, it impacts all of us, so we must all be involved. And it's interesting that we do this comment here in Texas because a lot of this fight started here with Biden versus Dole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Alonso, for giving us a Synopsis of the bill, uh, which is intended to take effect on September 1st. It's now my job to give a brief overview of what's happening in court surrounding SB4. Um, the signing of SB4 was extraordinary because Governor Abbott chose to sign it on a Sunday afternoon on Facebook Live with the only media outlet invited to be there, White Bart News. So that gives you a sense of their own understanding of the bill that they were enacting, that they signed it on a, at a time during the week when it would not garner much attention and only invited the right-wing extremist Breitbart News to be there. Then, equally extraordinarily, the day after Governor Abbott signed the law, the state of Texas filed a preemptive lawsuit seeking to have the law declared constitutional. This is because they recognized immediately that there would be, as a representative indicated, a challenge in court. They knew that there were serious constitutional questions about SB4, and they wanted to choose where that case would be heard. So they took the unprecedented step, well, almost unprecedented, uh, almost unprecedented step of filing their own lawsuit. They sued officials from the city of Austin, officials from Travis County, and they sued Maldeff as an organization. Now, such a lawsuit is frivolous and has no uh, constitutional basis for being in court. Under our court system, it's the plaintiffs who are challenging a law that get to choose where to file their lawsuit. It's not the defendants who get to file a preemptive suit seeking to determine what judge, where the constitutionality will be decided. So, needless to say, the reaction to the filing of that preemptive lawsuit was a number of motions to dismiss. Now, as others stepped forward, all of the major jurisdictions, as the representative indicated, to challenge 
as before in their own lawsuits, the state started to amend their preemptive lawsuit to name as defendants anybody who stepped forward as a plaintiff in a case challenging SB4. Long story short, that preemptive case still exists, but the latest indication is the judge there is skeptical, would be fair to say, about the propriety of his hearing a challenge to SB4 filed by the defendants, rather than allowing the judge, Judge Garcia here in San Antonio, where the cases challenging SB4 filed by plaintiff jurisdictions have been consolidated to determine the constitutionality of SB4. I will note that when Maldef threatened the state of Texas with sanctions for filing a frivolous action against them, the state of Texas did dismiss us as a defendant because they realized that their case was frivolous against a law firm, basically. The challenges that have been filed, now consolidated before Judge Garcia here in San Antonio, have resulted in numerous requests to have the law preliminarily enjoined, prevented from being implemented on its intended date of September 1st. Last week, Judge Garcia heard argument and heard from a number of very powerful witnesses in court about why SB4 ran a risk of creating irreparable harm that could not be compensated by damages later on were the plaintiffs to prevail, and strong evidence of the likely unconstitutionality of SB4. Let me briefly talk about that. As you heard from the representative, this is a bill that seeks to ensure that immigrants throughout the state of Texas are afraid, with good reason, that in the course of going about their daily lives, they will be swept in to a law enforcement detention or arrest involving an officer who chooses to enforce federal immigration law and that that could then lead to their being placed in removal and possibly detention. There are basically two significant operational provisions of this law. One, as you've heard, requires every jurisdiction, regardless of what they decide at the local level, to honor detainer requests from the Federal Immigration Enforcement Service. That means that when they are asked to detain someone beyond when they would ordinarily be kept in jail, on an arrest, in other words, even if they've made bail, been allowed to be released on their own recognizance, or even been determined not to be charged and would therefore be released, if there is a request from ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, to detain that person under SB4, every jurisdiction, every sheriff, would have no choice but to detain that person. The problem with that, as you've heard, is that there are already cases that have concluded, including here in Texas, that that is a violation in many circumstances of the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment protects all of us, every person, regardless of citizenship or immigration status, from being unlawfully detained by anyone, including a sheriff. There has to be constitutionally requisite cause, ordinarily probable cause, to continue to hold someone. Detainer requests, in most circumstances, do not provide probable cause. And therefore, when people are held on those detainers, it is unlawful under the Constitution. So basically, the first important provision of SB 4 requires jurisdictions to violate the Fourth Amendment. Second major provision that you may have heard referred to as the show me your papers provision. But I want to convince you that it's not really a show me your papers law. Because unlike Arizona's SB 1070, SB 4 does not require any police officer to engage in immigration enforcement. It simply permits every officer to decide on his or her own whether and how to enforce immigration law. So this means each individual officer, whether they've been on the job for a day or 10 years, and even if they've been on the job for 10 years, they were never trained in immigration law. But each of those individual officers gets to decide whether and how to enforce immigration law. This is why I would characterize this as a badged vigilantes provision, not a show me your papers provision. It is basically licensing anyone with a badge in the state of Texas, thousands of officers, like vigilantes to decide on their own how to enforce immigration law and whether to enforce immigration law. 
The rest of the provisions of SB4 create all kinds of disincentives, deterrence, for the folks that we ordinarily expect to provide guidance and regulation of those officers from doing so. Sheriffs, police chiefs, city council members, mayors, are barred by SB4 from interfering with any individual officer's decision to enforce immigration law and how they go about doing it with the threat of criminal prosecution, exorbitant fines, and even being removed from elective office if you were elected to office. So it basically ensures that each of those officers can decide on their own whether to opt in to enforcing immigration law and how to go about doing it. You can imagine the kinds of officers who are most likely to opt in. This leads to some of the other contentions, constitutional contentions about the law. It will invite racial profiling because untrained officers who decide to opt in are very likely to engage in unconstitutional racial profiling discrimination. It provides no control over police officers, and under our Constitution, we're entitled to not have vigilantes, whether with badges or not, roaming through the state of Texas deciding what to do. And finally, I will mention one more critical contention, and that is that this law was enacted with a racially discriminatory purpose. And there was strong evidence presented that a legislature that has already been found by other courts in the context of voting to have, gay, have engaged in intentional racial discrimination, that that same legislature engaged in the same intentional racial discrimination here. So bottom line, court cases pending, a decision on preliminary injunction pending, no implementation until September 1st, so there's no reason in the state of Texas to have fear or, or confusion about this fact at this point, and strong hopes that the law will be prevented by court from taking effect. Nonetheless, there is a challenge remaining, whether it's stopped in court or not, that we should address. And we have two folks from within Texas working for NHLA member organizations. We're going to talk about some of the important work occurring now in reaction and even in anticipation of what SB4 means to the Latino community and to Texas as a whole. And the first that we're going to hear from is the Texas Associate Director of Policy and Advocacy for NHLA member organization, the National Latino Institute for Reproductive Health. She is working throughout Texas on organizing and advocacy on behalf of the Latina Institute in reaction not just to SB4, but to the other threats faced by the Latina community in the state of Texas. Nancy Cardenas. Hi folks. Um, so I work for the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health and I am based in Austin, Texas. I was born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley um, and so much of our base and much of our work um, concentrates on the Rio Grande Valley. Um, so when we talk about SB4, we always like to apply a particularly different lens to it, and it's that this is an intersectional issue, that there are different issues at play, and it's not just an immigration enforcement issue. Um, so when we talk about SB4, we also talk about reproductive health care. We talk about how um, strict immigration laws affect folks' access to their reproductive health care um, services. Um, so a particular example um, is in the Rio Grande Valley where um, immigration enforcement is a beast of its own because there isn't just ICE, there's also Border Patrol um, that folks have to worry about on the ground. Um, so as the conversations around SB4 were happening, um, we were very unapologetic about bringing up reproductive health care services in immigration spaces. Um, because um, a lot of our members um, are undocumented from our organization and um, they are volunteers for our organization um, that do a lot of canvassing um, and they also talk a lot about reproductive health care services in the colonias in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, so one of the biggest concerns that we had is how SB4 was going to affect day-to-day uh, -day life in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and so something that uh, needs to be talked about is this has always been happening, right? Immigration has always stopped folks. Um, there hasn't been anything that has stopped police officers or any other entities to ask folks about their documentation status. 
Um, and so uh, one of the issues that we encountered um, during the SB4 conversation and when the raids started happening in Texas um, was Border Patrol and ICE um, along routes to healthcare clinics. Um, specifically being parked outside of Rio Grande Valley um, health clinics. Um, and so there have been a lot of conversations with a lot of coalition partners in the Rio Grande Valley um, because folks um, were very hesitant or needed, um, basically needed someone to accompany them to their health care appointments. Um, and so when we talk about SB4, I always want to bring up that it's not just an immigration issue, it's also a reproductive health care issue. Um, folks don't come into the space and stop needing reproductive health care services and all of those other realities just stop existing. Um, we live uh, multi-issued lives and so um, that's something that we've always brought up. Um, so um, if you all are unfamiliar with the Rio Grande Valley, um, there is only <coughs> one abortion clinic in the Rio Grande Valley um, that services a very, very large area. And so whenever folks are talking about the Rio Grande Valley, they always like to um, think that we're all just this, like one cluster of folks, but it's hours apart. There's a lot of cities. Um, and so um, when we're talking about SB4, we also have to talk about how this will impact um, the one abortion clinic that we have left in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, so another aspect of this, um, because I have done a lot of local work um, around immigration policies, um, and it's a lot of conversations that were happening around what does a sanctuary city policy actually do, and how does it affect folks um, from different municipalities? Because, like I was saying, these things were happening already. Like this, it, it's not like SB4 is going to start um, giving entities the power to ask for a documentation status. This has always been the case. Um, and a lot of the entities that um, were a part of the lawsuit um, also participated in these programs. So the city of Austin didn't have a sanctuary cities policy. Um, there's no policy in place for the city of Austin that prevents its uh, police officers from asking folks about their um, documentation status. Um, but a lot of the conversations that we were having was strictly about police um, enforcement and them asking about documentation status. But I really wanted to challenge folks to learn how cities uh, cooperate with immigration when it comes to information sharing, um, when it comes to um, Homeland Security's access to folks' utility bills, um, which is something that um, is a factor when cities have fusion centers. Um, so there are a lot of ways in which cities can cooperate with immigration that's not just strictly police asking folks about their documentation status. Um, and so we in the Rio Grande Valley were faced with a very, very unique um, situation, which was um, even though there were other municipalities um, that supported SB4, um, our um, dear local um, elected officials um, and local law enforcement publicly came out um, in an op-ed with Greg Abbott to talk about their support of us before. Um, and so we organized in the Valley and a lot of coalition partners signed on and we publicly demanded that they retract their statements. Um, so we have uh, the city of Brownsville that is going to vote soon to join the lawsuit um, against us before and we're also pushing other cities to do that as well. Um, so that's part of a bit of the local aspect of this. Um, but we've also been talking about how we're going to help our members on the ground when it comes to um, the new law taking effect. Um, and so thanks to um, ICE out of Austin, uh, we've been incorporating binder trainings for our members, um, which is bas basically a deportation um, defense packet. Um, with power of attorney forms, uh, with letters of recommendation, um, basically a packet um, prepared um, neatly for a lawyer in case someone gets detained. Um, so we've really been trying to open the, think outside the box when it comes to how we're going to react and how we're going to live in a post us before world. Thank you, Nancy, for placing SB4 in the context of ongoing threats of federal immigration enforcement that has particularly been heightened under the current administration. And I do want to note that the administration has 
taken a position in the litigation in support of SB4 at this point, uh, indicating the strong connection between the forces in Texas that enacted it, this and the Trump administration. Thank you also for explaining the impacts of SB4 on folks' everyday lives and the threats that they face in going to clinics and the like. Uh, we will now hear from an immigrant activist who's been working on behalf of progressive causes for 25 years. He is the Texas State Director of Mi Familia Vota Educational Fund, Carlos Duarte. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I want to introduce myself by saying that I've been living in the United States for 20 years, and I am a survivor of SB 1070 in Arizona, where my wife was actually racially profiled, and now I get to relive the, the whole thing again now in Texas. Um, I want to say that this is now ground zero uh, for the fight to defend our Constitution. It's not only a fight for immigrants, but it's really, uh, like, like it has been mentioned, a, a racial profiling law. Uh, and I want to assure you that we are going to win. This is a battle that we're going to win. And the reason that we are going to win is because we are organizing and we're fighting back at so many But the reason that we're going to win is not only because of the local efforts to fight back, but also because of the support that we're getting from the national organizations. So I want to take this opportunity to thank obviously LULAC, NHLA, and other organizations that have been instrumental in uh, fortifying the efforts that we're doing at the local level. So what I want to do you know, with, with my seven minutes is, number one, to describe a little bit of the work that we're doing locally. Uh, I want to emphasize how this law has impacted uh, efforts for civic engagement, but I really want to hone in as what is it that you can do? And again, I mentioned that we're going to win, but we're going to win because you're going to help us. Uh, so what is it that you can do as an individual? And then what is it that you can do as a member of organizations at the national level? And, and that's basically what I, what I want to talk about. Um, be, before I go into that, I, I do want to share with you what happened to us in this 4th of July celebration of independence. So we're in Huntsville, uh, north, north of Houston, just uh, south of Dallas. So it's a wonderful place. It's, it's, it's a lake. We are kayaking. We're having a fantastic uh, day with the family. Uh, and then, unbeknownst to me, my 17-year-old daughter uh, wants to go to the restroom. And because it's a big park, she grabs the keys, she turns on the car, she drives to the restroom and back. Mind you, she does not have a driver's license. When she's coming back, um, the park ranger is waiting right in front of her, right, just parked, minding his business. And then she panics, and then she leaves the car uh, without parking it properly. And, and it's like, and, and, and you know, my daughter is like the perfect daughter. She's never gotten in trouble at all. Um, so as I'm, I'm walking in, the park, the park ranger realizes that this car is, is wrongly parked uh, and approaches her. And, you know, long story short, he ends up asking for our documentation, right? So like, uh, she, obviously, she doesn't have a driver's license. And uh, my, my driver's license is not on me, right? We're in a park. I'm actually in a swimming suit. <laughs> uh, and obviously, they failed to produce uh, identification. Fortunately, my wife walks in at that time, produces her uh, Arizona driver's license, and uh, the officer says, you know, the system is down in Arizona, it seems, so I'm just going to assume that this is a valid document, right? We're fortunate, right? We, we have a driver's license. If we had not had a driver's license, he could have had the opportunity to say, we're going to detain you, and then, you know, and again, so I think it goes to the point that Nancy was making that it before has not been implemented yet, but we're already seeing some of the effects. 90% uh, of the population that were at the park that they were Latinos, and I can guarantee you that several of them did not have a driver's license. So what was a fantastic family day could have ended in a tragedy, right, for any other family right there. And I think that's, that's the impact, right? Uh, so anyway, what is it that we're doing uh, to fight against this? Uh, you know, I'm really proud to say that Texans have reacted very forcefully at all levels. You know, the, the organizing is happening at the city level, at the county level, and at the state level. And we have come up with at least two very powerful coalitions. Uh, one of them is the Reform Immigration for Texas Alliance that has been in place for several years and that has been instrumental in stopping uh, anti-sanctuary city bills legislature has after the legislature and then there's a new coalition with, with groups that have been uh, Austin based right including ACLU, Workers Defense Project, Texas Organizing Project and so many more. 
Um, we have organized ourselves in two different ways. One is we're organizing at the local level with efforts, for example, you know, getting the city of Dallas, the city of Houston to actually join the lawsuit, uh, and also statewide, right, where we are coordinating uh, based on, I would say, uh, five main strategies to fight back. One, obviously, is the legal strategy, obviously being led by MALDEV, ACLU, and TCRP. Uh, number two is obviously the political and mobilization strategy, right? So, for example, uh, you might have heard that um, at the closing of the, of the legislative session, uh, we basically packed uh, uh, the legislature, right? And Matt Rinaldi basically called eyes on all of the protesters. Um, so, so some of the work that has been done, including groups you know, like Indivisible, uh, you know, we organize some protests across the across the state in the law firm that employs uh, Representative Rinaldi. Um, so, so part of the political uh, pressure that has happened at the city to get the mayors to join the lawsuit um, uh, and to you know specific representatives has happened because of all of the local uh, organizing. Um, obviously, we're we're talking about economic pressure, and I want to leave that to the end. Uh, we're also doing base building and defense. Like Nancy was saying, it, it's already happening. So we are doing a number of uh, no new rights sessions, you know, all across the state. Uh, we are, you know, there are some groups that are actually defending people that are already on deportation proceedings. Um, so, so that is, it's, it's an aspect of it. And, and I want to emphasize that this is actually one of the best opportunities that we've ever had in Texas to really organize. And what I've seen is how many uh, people have started developing leadership skills that they hadn't had before because it presents these opportunities at all the, you know, from high school students that are testifying for the very first time at some committee meetings uh, to obviously some of our elected officials that are assuming a more prominent role. Uh, and then finally, you know, we have civic engagement and, uh, and voter mobilization. Uh, and, you know, I would say that the, the impact has been that now we're becoming more targeted. So where is it that we can actually make an impact? by educating voters on how legislators voted with regards to SB4 uh, and how is it that we can um, mobilize in those particular districts. Now, so what is it that people can do individually? What is it that you can do? Well, number one is, um, you know, you can join the lawsuit if you're a victim of, of, of SB4. Uh, obviously, uh, there's always a, a need for, for, uh, for plaintiffs that have been affected. Um, number two, you can help us mobilize to put pressures on elected officials uh, because we need to have, you know, school districts, uh, some other counties, cities, private universities, hospitals, because they do provide specific uh, elements to, um, to showing how this is going to be affecting. Um, joint base building efforts and defense efforts and joint voter registration and voter education uh, and mobilization drives in your, in your uh, areas if you're here in Texas. Now, if you're from an outside organization, what is it that we can do? Well, number one, you can help us recruit other municipalities and states. Uh, for example, California has already stated, you know, not related to us before, but because of a discrimination bill, uh, that they are not going to be doing business with Texas and they're not going to be sending their, uh, their elected officials here. So that's one of the things that we're hoping that you can help us do, right? So get your municipalities to, to make statements opposing as before and doing business. Uh, so that's one. Number two, uh, if you belong to an organization that was hoping to host events in Texas, we are asking you to basically say, we are not doing business with Texas as long as it before, uh, you know, continues to be in the books. And then finally, we will be identifying some corporations that might have an impact in getting this law overturned, right? You know, so corporations that might have the, the ear of, of Governor Abbott, we're going to be putting pressure on them, and some of them might be chains. So if, if those chains have uh, business in your state, we want you to support us by putting pressure on them right there in your state. So obviously, the Texas economy is huge. Uh, we do know that the main damage is going to be to Texas reputation. It's already happening. But I think that we are only going to win if we get the support from all of you guys across the nation. So, that's it. Thank you, Carlos, for telling us all of the important organizing efforts and how those outside of Texas can support them. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to open it up to questions from uh, all of you, so please uh, have your questions prepared. I do want to ask a couple of questions on my own. Uh, Representative Alonso, um, 
Governor Abbott has called you all into special session beginning later this month. I don't think he's included this on the call, but he can obviously call for another special session. Is there any chance that this law might be modified as the legislature did with voter ID in response to controversy, in response to the court action? Is there any chance that the legislature could take this up again prior to your next regular session two years from now? Uh, no, because in the history of Texas, uh, they don't modify until after you guys win the lawsuit, which is what you see in the paper today. Uh, after the lawsuit was won on voter ID, then it went back to the legislature to modify. Uh, but like anything, you know, if you don't try, you don't get. So of course we must all, always make the effort. So that's my job. And I, and, uh, I want to comment, as, as you were pointing out, about the boycott uh, from California on uh, the bathroom bill. Uh, in, in thinking about that issue, it, my, my take on it, as you said, is discrimination. Discrimination on immigration, discrimination on bathroom bill. But as I look at the bathroom bill, it's not them and us, it's us. Uh, and I say that because in some of our comments we say, why don't we use the strategy of the bathroom bill by getting business engaged? And we did ask business to get engaged. And four years ago or so, they did get engaged and stopped it. But I think that what happened this time, they said, we have the bathroom bill, we have SB4, we'll you know, stop the bathroom bill and hold back on, on, on the immigration. Uh, I don't think it's the right thing to do, but I'll, I'll comment that if they discriminate against us on immigration, the folks on the bathroom boat is also discriminating us, and I'll tell you real quick why. When Orlando happened in Orlando, Florida, 49 of the 50 kids that were killed were Latinos. If you go like I do to the uh, gay pride parade, if you look at the audience, 70% of the audience at the parade are Latinos. So as we look at these issues, they are us as well. You know, one community, of course. Uh, Nancy, let me ask you, uh, you've talked about the impact of immigration enforcement on access to clinics uh, and the like. And you know, one thing I note about SB4, and I note it because last month was the 35th anniversary of Plyler versus Doe, a decision out of Texas by the U.S. Supreme Court establishing the right of every student to attend public school regardless of immigration status from kindergarten through 12th grade. So one thing that is specifically excluded in SB4 is kindergarten through 12th grade public school. In other words, if there are police forces at kindergarten through 12th grade school districts, those police officers don't have the uh, right under SB4 to decide whether and how to enforce immigration law. It's the only exception. But Nancy, I wonder if you could talk about whether that means kids are safe. Uh, I mean, they're still potentially subjects to immigration enforcement by officers outside of school, as you mentioned, on the way to clinic, on the way to school. Can you talk a little more about how the failure to leave out sensitive locations besides kindergarten through 12th grade school has an impact? Um, yes, of course. Um, and I think um, this is something that, as you are very aware, was um, discussed um, here in San Antonio when the lawsuit came, that um, lots of folks stopped sending their children to school, and it was something that we saw, especially during the raids in Austin. Um, folks, um, school attendance dropped uh, dramatically. Um, so it's something that we have definitely seen, um, and I think it's something that we're definitely going to see a lot more of as SB4 is implemented. Um, I think something that I didn't add before, and um, going with the question that you just asked um, about sensitive locations memo, um, is that a lot of the conversations that we've also been trying to have is um, trying to adapt um, to ICE and Border Patrol um, being on route to our community meetings um, and our community healthcare clinics. So sometimes we've had to change the location of where we've conducted that. And so um, the sensitive location memo includes churches. And so we've really incorporated the use of churches in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, to hold um, our healthcare clinics or conduct community meetings. Um, I mean, it's not a policy that is set in stone, um, but ICE usually does not go into churches um, in order to do immigration enforcement. Thank you. And my last question before I go to the audience, uh, Carlos, you talked about some of the efforts in response and building civic engagement 
Uh, I wonder if you could talk about naturalization and whether that's a part of the necessary response to SB4 here in Texas. Definitely. So civic engagement is, is one of the key elements on, in the strategy to fight SB, SB4. Uh, we know that there are um, huge numbers of Latinos, particularly, that, that, uh, that uh, qualify for citizenship and, and are not doing it at the, at the rate that they should. Uh, but there are organizing, you know, very organized efforts that are pushing for that. And actually, it's, it's something that started happening with the Trump uh, campaign, uh, that people started asking more, you know, to the point that, you know, in the past we would have to go and convince people, you know, you should do it because of this, you know, X, Y, and Z. Now people are coming to us saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not safe as a resident anymore. Uh, but I think that as before, it's enhancing, it's enhancing that, that aspect. Uh, I, I want to emphasize that the fight to SB4, it's, it's uh, at multiple levels. So one of the key fights that we are engaging, for example, in Houston, is trying to get policies with city um, police uh, so that they do not detain people that do not have a driver's license, right? Because the police officer basically has the opportunity to say, okay, so you're driving without a license. Um, you cannot drive this car anymore in front of me, right? However, if someone can come and pick up the car. Now, if they detain that individual, then they go into the whole process of maybe being deported. And that is a fight that can be won at the local level, and that is something that is already happening. So there are multiple spaces where we can uh, fight back against this destruction and separation of our families, uh, and I think that, that is important. Thank you. So, questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jose Trevino with a non-profit organization called MAD, American Democrats. And uh, we, is it safe to say, Mr. Alonso, uh, uh, can we equate S. Bill 4 with Proposition 187, where Pete Wilson is rearing his ugly head in Texas, where, where people would be forced to <coughs> turn in undocumented people, teachers, uh, emergency room staff, would have to be be used by ICE as an extension of the INS, and I don't think that's a problem. Yeah, the answer is yes. It's similar, as you will recall, uh, in Texas, we were very aggressive against 187. I personally had a, a press conference asking that we boycott California because of 187, and I said even Mickey Mouse. Uh, and in, in, in adding to your comments about uh, uh, pressuring elected officials within the group, ex American Democrats, what we, we do is ask that question. How do you stand on this SB4? How do you stand on immigration? How do you, you know, what's your position going to be? And we would have, on many occasions, political candidates that say, I don't have to answer the question because I'm running for JP, and it doesn't impact me. Well, it does. So. And adding to your comment about pressuring elected officials, especially if we move into the election cycle, putting that question at the, at the top of the list. In addition, would be to have, uh, you know, all the schools, even our, where Chicanos are the majority, because it impacts all people, they do a welcoming resolution. Um, finally, I'll say one of the things that we did here in Texas, uh, in 1994, was ask that the Democratic Party take a position on you know, immigration. And uh, the current senator from Boston was at the time, Kurt Watson was chairman was of the Democratic Party. And he said, we're not going to have none of that because it will embarrass the governor, which was Ann Richards at the time. And our guys got personal and said, look, this is not about you, this is about our community getting beat up. So 1994, we're, because of that, we were able to put that on the platform. And six years later, for Texas, uh, then the National Organization of Democrats added to the national platform, and since then it's been part of the platform as well. Thank you for your question. Oh, hi, my name is Lilia Galindo. I came from California. I have seen that the number of people who has become citizens has increased significantly. Also, people registered to vote, but they don't go out and vote. That is the big problem. I see that we make a lot of effort. How, how can we be sure to follow up that all the people that we register have to go to vote, and they vote in all the levels, because they only vote for president. How, how are we going to resolve that problem? Thank you. So I, th I think that's a crucial question. Thank you for that. Um, we need to understand that in Texas, we have a very organized and strategic effort to prevent Latinos from voting. 
And I'm not saying it, it's the, it's the Supreme Court that is saying it, right? So we have the redistricting, that's actually, uh, we have a, a hearing on Monday, if I'm not mistaken, here in San Antonio. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, yeah, it's the gerrymandering. But then the voter ID, even the voter ID, uh, there was a, a, some research done recently that showed that a significant proportion of Latinos did not vote, not because they did not have the proper identification, but because they thought that they didn't have the proper identification. So all of this is intentional confusion, uh, it, it, you know, intended to discriminate against Latinos in particular. And as before, it's you know, in that way, I would say that as before, it's a gift because it's just putting out, you know, in the open what has been happening underneath, you know, through throughout all of the different levels of government. Having said that, uh, I think that. Uh, a lot of the groups that finance and, and help get out the vote, because it is a concerted effort, right? I mean, it takes money.